afternoon, everyone. My name is Jenny Stiff, and I'm coming to you from the gifted office here at Camp Edwards. I hope everyone is having an awesome Friday. We are almost done with our day, and I appreciate you all tuning in to the Zoom session late this Friday afternoon. I have one of my coworkers with me, Mrs. Nyetta Williams Hill. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, just drop them into the chat and she'll address those as we go through. So let's get started with servicing students in creativity. So my name again is Jenny Stith. If you want to reach out to me at any time, my email is at the bottom of the screen. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, I left my handle down there. We tend to tweet out resources and all things gifted. So it might be something if you're on the Twitter world to do and follow me. So we're going to get started. I'm here today to talk to you about servicing your students in creativity. I'm going to start with a quote I really like because I want you to understand that when it comes to creativity, you have to look at the world in a more gray fashion. Answers aren't as black and white because you need the room in their brains to reason and use that abstract thinking. And so I love this quote about failing. We need to teach kids how to fail. And uh, further in the presentation, you're going to see a quote about how as we get older, we tend to have creativity taught right out of us because we have clear, concrete, right and wrong answers. And in the world, as I said, we need more opportunities for them to fail and learn from their mistakes and be comfortable failing. So break the rules and let's get into some creativity. I like this quote as well, just because it kind of introduces you to the creative thinker. You might see this as a pile of rocks, but a creative thinker absolutely sees this as potential and, as you can see, a cathedral. And I really like this analogy to really help you understand that creative thinkers can come up with ideas from a pile of rocks and imagine beautiful things. Right here, I have linked you to a TED Talk about creativity. I'm not gonna watch it today, but this, uh, Sir Ken Robinson, he's funny. He really talks about why we need creativity in our schools. So I would encourage you, if you have 20 minutes sometime, to watch this because it is really amazing. And here is that quote I was talking about. Young children thrive with creativity, but it tends to diminish as we get older into our schools. And I like the term, it's educated out of us. So we want to try to bring back that idea of failure and giving new ideas to old ways. So why do we need to focus on creativity? Well, the biggest important thing is that it's a 21st century skill that we all need. There are jobs today where during the interview, you have to tell them what you want to do for them. So that's a different way of thinking. Instead of the job being listed out for you, you come in and argue why you could do something for this company. So it's a skill that kids need. I love that it develops a growth mindset. It's a great tool for differentiation. Your general intellectual kids and your specific academic kids all benefit from uh, creative thinking. It's the highest level of blooms, so it is the most innovative thinking skills that you can give students. So that's why it's a great tool for helping promote critical thinking. Your achievement tends to skyrocket and student engagement, which we all know are the things that the classroom definitely wants. It's problem solving skills and it helps students think more abstractly. And most importantly, any of the activities that I'm going to present today will count as services for your creatively gifted students who I hope you have identified or are in the process of identifying. One, what I gave you here is just a link to a PDF file that kind of lays out characteristics of a high achiever, which is more like an advanced placement student a gifted learner, which is your general intellectual and your specific academic aptitude students. Those are just generally students who are pretty smart. And then the last column is the one I really want you to focus through. And this is the characteristics of creative thinkers. And you might see them daydreaming. They love to play with ideas and concepts. They're notorious for getting you off task as a classroom teacher. They can take you way off task. 
And that is a skill that they are definitely strong at. They make mental leaps and things. They share bizarre and wild ideas. So it's a little bit different. So when you get a minute, take some time and share with your staff some of these characteristics so they can really see a difference between the three types of learners. So that's on that link. And by the way, if most of us are familiar with Google Slides, but anything that's red and underlined is a hot link, and it is linked to resources for you all and for your school. So please use those. Well, hopefully you watched the last Zoom session, and as we learned, divergent thinking is the epitome of creativity, and it's broken down into four categories of fluency, flexibility, elaboration, and originality. And the good news about this area of giftedness is oftentimes these skills can be developed over time and taught, whereas some of the other areas, it's not. It's just you're smart or you're not. You're cognitively have a high IQ or you average or whatever your IQ is. Those tend to be more of concrete and they don't move around, whereas creativity really can be developed, which I like. So what we're going to do is break down each one of the four areas and give you some concrete classroom examples on how you can service this and build these thinking skills. The first one we're going to start with is fluency. And as you can see, fluency is just generating multiple ideas. And I would argue that every single teacher in Jefferson County is brainstorming and help having students practice fluency skills. So I want you to remember that this isn't adding extra things into your lesson. It's just about being intentional and understanding what measures what and what goes with what skills go with fluency and parts of our divergent thinking. So I've left some just general recommended classroom activities, concept mapping. I've seen that in all grade levels. It's a great way to build fluency skills. Give me five top 10 and picture a thousand words are from a researcher named Bertie Kingor. She's a really neat lady and has lots to say in the gifted world. So if you want to Google those and learn more about them, I would encourage you to. And then, of course, we've already talked about brainstorming. So here I have given you just some basic examples for building fluency in the classroom for the elementary, middle, and high school level. And oftentimes in elementary school, you're working with rhyming words and getting kids to recognize sounds. So an idea is just simply make a list of words that rhyme. Brainstorm ways, brainstorm ways our main character could have gotten out of his situation. So it's the hypothetical. What if questions are great for building fluency and creativity? Let's look at middle school. One of my favorite favorite examples is, give me the top 10 things that would change if the squirrel population started doubling on a weekly basis. So we're really focusing on the science standard of populations and ecosystems. And again, going back to the abstract thinking of what might happen to the environment, to the other animals. And that really gets that divergent thinking stretching. High school, some of the Ways I think you could do it is give me top 10 reasons why people should get what they deserve. That's a powerful concept, getting what you deserve. So you could get students to brainstorm and really um, build on why people should or shouldn't get what they deserve. And I'm taking these ideas from the curriculum maps because I want to make sure that our creativity isn't extra. It's just building on to the content that you're already expected to teach. The next area of divergent thinking is flexibility. And this is just basically categorizing ideas. Um, oftentimes it's looking at something from a different angle or a different point of view, shifting to an opposing viewpoint. So I'm an old ELA teacher, and we, in every content that I've seen, we argue, we formulate opinions, we support with reason and evidence. So a great skill would be to get the students to argue a different point of view that they don't agree in. I think a lot of teachers are already doing that. Here are some general activities for the classroom. Working with analogies is very strong. Even in young children, primary grades, they suggest helping them compare things, writing their own analogies, analyzing things, using SCAMPER, which if you're a future problem solving person, you've heard this acronym before, but we'll get into that and some examples of what that looks like in the classroom. 
But if you Google scamper activities, you will find oodles of things that have already been developed. Symbols, anytime you ask a student to draw and or write, you're using two different parts of the brain, therefore upping the level of creativity and learning cognitive abilities happening there. So I would encourage you to do that if you aren't already using drawing symbols, things like that in your classroom. Of course, comparing and contrasting questions are something every good teacher should use. So just be intentional about it and you're servicing students with creativity just by asking them to do that. Okay, here are some actual classroom activities and examples to help you. For primary and intermediate students, you can ask them to think of a different way to use something we already use. Just a quick opening activity, maybe if you're about to introduce science tools, just to have fun with them and get them to understand that although we'll be using them for science, you could use them for something else. And it's a fun, engaging way to start a lesson that sometimes can just be, this is the rules and this is why we have to do it. So it's kind of a fun way to try that. If you look here in the middle school column, I've connected you to a link for Scamper in case you are unfamiliar with it. I want to make sure, and I even showed an example of one I wrote. This was an eighth grade um, advanced lesson from a, a fable called The Stag Becomes a Sloth. I'm not going to read this to you, but if you want to see a way to use Scamper in an ELA classroom, this might be an example of something that you could use. The, the six thinking hats, this one down here, is not a strategy I've used in the classroom, but I learned it this year at the National Gifted Conference. It is spectacular. And for elementary students, she even modeled where you could go out and buy plastic hats and each kid wears. He's the empathy kid. And if you look into the strategy, you'll understand more of what I'm talking about. But it's a great activity for, I think, all grade levels. I think coming from a middle school background, maybe not the hats, but she said you could adapt it and find sunglasses the kids could wear. And then by high school, you could just say you're coming from this angle and this point of view. And just some way to make it a little bit different and getting them thinking from another person's perspective. Socratic circles is a great one I found for high school, although you could do it in all grade levels. This particular resource I'm sharing with you is for high school and I would say older middle schools, but it explains what the Socratic circle might look like, what you do before, during, and after, and then it goes down to suggest activities, text selection, things like that. So I really want to make sure that I'm supporting teachers in the classroom and helping you all understand needs and making sure you have the resources to do that. And so feel free to look around here and some of these concrete ways you can. Here is a middle school social studies example because one thing you don't have to teach any of these divergent thinking strategies in isolation. As a matter of fact, the more you can combine several, if not all of them, the higher the thinking skill becomes. So here is a social studies example of fluency and flexibility. So they brainstormed world problems, local problems, therefore demonstrating that multiple ideas, fluency, but then the flexibility comes when they have to brainstorm potential solutions. So two different types of thinking. You can see some classroom examples. I think they're kind of hard to see, but at least get you an idea for something you could share with your building. Here's a science example. Again, middle school, this is a middle school example, and it's developing fluency and flexibility by having students generate questions and then categorizing those questions. Another activity I used a lot in ELA classroom is a sort, and anytime you have students sorting things, vocabulary words, ideas, and labeling the categories, you're practicing flexibility. So that might be something to think about. Here is a third grade scamper activity for weather science. And you can see what the scamper acronym stands for if you're not familiar with it. Substitute, combine, adapt, modify, put to use, eliminate, rearrange. And very simple, just ways to question and get the kids to think in a little bit different way. So I'm going to give you a minute to just brainstorm and see if any of those ideas are hopefully causing you to get some ideas for your school and your classroom. 
Here is another example from a colleague of mine, Tiffany Morrison, and she modeled here, and I just stole it from her. We share ideas around here. And she had a reading, as you can see at the top, social studies, example, science, math. So we want to make sure we're hitting all the content areas. And arguably, you could do this in any special area by asking them about your own content, especially my related art folks, PE, music. You could absolutely find a way to use Scamper in those activities as well. The next one we've talked about already, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. This is the Socratic circle again, and this is a more primary or intermediate example, I think, even in middle school. If you aren't familiar with it, we've linked a right here and see it in action. There's a YouTube video, and you can go and watch it. This breaks down the procedures for you, and this continues. Oops, I skipped ahead. Hang on. Let me go back. And this continues the Socratic circle. So if you think this is something you might find useful, go ahead and read through there at your own time. All of these resources will be uploaded into our gifted drive under the creativity folder and also available on the JCPS Digital Learning. This Zoom presentation will be, you can view it again by Monday afternoon, just to let you know where you'll find it. Another strategy that I have not yet used, but I just learned about this year again at the National Gifted Conference, is this idea of reverse engineering. And I think it is a very high level skill. It is not the way I think. And so I think it would be good knowing that that's a weakness for to build growth. And so think about your own students and how they might benefit from looking at a solution and then backwards, almost like we do as teachers in backward planning. What do we want the end result to be and then working backwards to get there? So look through this if you think she gave some great math, science, and reading examples. And I just learned this this year. So if anyone gets into reverse engineering, I would love to hear about it and come watch or help you participate in this activity. I think it would be super neat and fun to do. So I hope it's something useful. The next area is what most of us consider the pinnacle of creativity. It's originality. And I think most of us, when we think of someone who is creative, we imagine this person. They generate unusual ideas. And so keep in mind that this is also the hardest one in a world where innovation is coming at us left and right and phones have changed our lives and digital technology. It's hard to come up with new ideas. And so I encourage you to really help students brainstorm ways they can come up with new and innovative ways. And so instead of specific classroom activities for elementary, middle, and high school, I just gave you general ways to get originality built into the curriculum. So an example that I've seen a lot is design of public service announcements, social studies class, rewriting plays, scenes, and books, the ending, that's totally new. So we have an original ending, but you're asking the student to come up with a new ending. That is totally innovative and original and therefore uh, really shining this piece of divergent thinking. Of course, down in science class, we constantly create solutions based on criteria and constraints using the engineering design process. It's a great way to get your students to think, think creatively and using those originality skills and building on that. Now, here are some tools for originality that are technology-based. I've given you some just classroom activities with paper, pencil, questioning strategies, and now I want to make sure that I'm appealing to my tech people, my techie folks. The two links at the top are from a PD I attended years ago through JCPS, the um, Techland University, and I have used these to this day, so I feel like I need to share with the rest of JCPS if you have not already seen these. These are apps that are fantastic for thinking and creating innovative and new products. So if you have iPads or Chromebooks, I encourage you, a lot of these are not just app-based, they are web-based. Some are free, some have free and paid subscriptions. So it'll be up to you to decide whether or not it's a resource you want for your school. And that there's a little description and a link connected in each one of these. So have time, go look around, share this resource. This one is also a link to the exact to a different list of apps, 
And then again, any one of the ones on my bulleted list here, if you haven't used them, they're great ways to create things. I love to create comic strips, going back to the ELA example. It's novel. They have to come up with their own idea. So it's a great way to build originality. It's engaging, and there's so many online resources. Then again, I'm, I like to draw. So you can do it with just paper and pencil and have the old-fashioned way as well. So I hope you can find some of these tools for originality useful in your classroom and for your school. Here's an example. Recently, if you're a JCPS Twitter person, which I am, you will see the tiny houses have taken over in several schools. This is an excellent project to build on originality. So I'll let you read through that. But just know that this is a fantastic way to build originality. Here's another high school example. I want to not forget my older folks. Um, it's a literature example, and if you can see, comparing and contrasting two works we've already seen as a way to build our fluency and flexibility by comparing and contrasting. And then to add on that originality piece, the, um, the teacher asks the students to create an illustration that compares and contrasts the trials in the Crucible and 12 Angry Men. And then you can see there was a written piece but they also allow the students that creative outlet of representing something in a visual way. This is very engaging for many students, and I would encourage you to try something similar in your own classrooms and buildings. Here is another example of just originality and flexibility. So you can kind of, the students were coming up with secondary and primary sources about themselves. That's very connected to social studies getting them to understand the importance of those documents. And then, of course, you can look at the flexibility when you have time and go through if this is an example for you to use. The final piece of divergent thinking is elaboration. And elaboration is just what the word sounds like, adding to or embellishing ideas. So, again, back to English. Anytime you want the students to add more details, which I know that was a common feedback for me, then you're adding and building on their elaboration skills. Show, don't tell, the classic sentence. Again, helping the students to elaborate. So here are some general activities. This one is very similar to originality in that there aren't particular things for elementary, middle, and high school. It's just kind of across the board, K through 12, because you can create a category grid in any grade level. You can do reverse brainstorming or the reverse engineering, which is what we talked about earlier. And lost and found is another uh, classroom activity I'm not familiar with, but if you Google uh, her name, Drapeu, and lost and found, you'll find lots of really cool ideas for your classroom. I think it would be one worth trying. And so again, just like the originality, I just gave you some ideas of what elaboration tasks might look like in your classroom. Illustrating idioms, adding details. Anytime you ask a student to write a poem, you're asking them to elaborate on a topic. You could finish story starters. It's a great warm-up activity. Maybe on a Friday you use this every Friday and have a sentence or a story starter and have them finish it with elaborating, building on those skills. I really like this one for primary grades, writing a story problem to show 30 plus 20 equals 50. I see that a lot in classrooms. Again, I just want you to reinforce to you that these skills are not extra. You're doing them most likely in your classroom already. So the servicing part for students who are creatively thinking isn't an extra step for you. We want to make sure you have some ideas. Um, I really like the create a campaign poster for Civil War slogans. You're really touching on some history there. So hopefully these are some ideas that can help you and your school move forward. Here is another website I found, and all of these are technology tools. And again, some of them are free, some of them have free services, and then you can buy on. But fantastic. If you haven't used some of them, I encourage you to go around and look at them. And I tried to make sure to include mostly free ones because I know as a teacher, we don't have unlimited funds to just spend all our money on. So I want to make sure you have some things to look for. 
Now down to frequency of services. We get asked this question a lot. Um, really minimally bi-monthly is what most schools are able to do. So 60 minutes every couple months, I mean twice a month is a perfectly acceptable way to service these students. When I was a gifted coordinator, I was able to pull them out in primary grades for weekly pull outs of 30 to 40 minutes. It is not necessary to do it this frequently, but you can if you have the resources and the ability, it's great. And then of course in middle school, a lot of schools are implementing like creativity hour or genius hour or problem solving hour every couple weeks. On a Friday during an intervention time, they're moving students to find ways to build it into your schedule. So I thought I'd share some of those ideas that other middle schools that I'm working with have used to start servicing. And they're doing that on a bi-monthly basis or every two weeks on Friday for about an hour. They're um, letting those kids experience divergent thinking skills that we've talked about. So hopefully this helps. I think you could argue that you can do creativity every day and as a classroom teacher. It isn't that hard to implement some of these skills. Do you have to? Of course not. But it is just another way for you to say you're servicing students by just showing this is the questions I asked this week. These kids are exposed to creativity um, twice a week when we do our warm-ups or our closer or we do our products, things like that. So keep, keep that in mind as well if you're a go-getter, which I hope all of you are. And finally, I've listed just some resources for you. That first link at the top was where I found all those technology tools, so feel free to go look there yourself. The second one is a book, and I've included a picture. This one is just what it sounds like in the title. Practical ways to use problem solving and innovative thinking in your classroom. This is pretty reasonably priced, and so if you're interested in books, you might want to take a look at that. Creativity resources, if you just click there, it's going to take you to some more options. Here are two more books that I have found to be very reasonably priced and excellent, just ready to use products for thinking, building divergent thinking skills. And then, of course, some of my favorite ones, if you're not familiar with Odyssey of the Mind, it is a fantastic tool for building creative thinking. They always come out with a current problem, which is this one our problems, and then the past problems. So if you click on this link, they release every single problem they've ever used, and there are tons of ready-to-go classroom ideas from K all the way up through high school for you to use, and I will let you, it is a neat, neat resource, and I really like some of, they are really out there as far as their ideas and what they come up with. Great service for creativity. And then down at the bottom here, I've linked you to Genius Hour Ideas. A lot of middle schools are going to that on a bi-weekly basis. And so it's a great spot for you to find some resources if you're looking for that. And then the last thing that I've included is a Scranimals lesson that I developed years ago. For I've used it in elementary and middle school. And you just have to differentiate your questions. But what I've linked you to is a intermediate level four or five split I use this on. The book is called again Scranimals and it's by Jack Boletsky which most of you if you're an English teacher know. He's written a lot of poetry books and so I've shared with you a PowerPoint project. You can see back in the day I used it in seventh grade but I've also created some choice boards and ideas to use the engineering design process under building a boat a choice board that really gets you creative thinking. And if you've never seen a scramble, let me pull up one. A scramble is a hybrid creature, so you can see the two that I thought of was a two cantaloupe and a kangaroo to bag it. And you will read the book, it's very clear, the rules, and you teach the kids the rules, and then they have to come up with their own scramble's. Excuse me. And you can read through that I had them thinking of some new ways Will they think scientifically now? Will these species survive? I included physical features for social studies connections, things like that. So I just thought I'd share to show you how you can just take a book and develop a whole unit on creativity, reaching multiple content areas, combining all ideas to build on that creativity. So I wanted to share that with you today as well. And 
thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to leave the meeting up for probably another 30, 40 seconds. And then if no one has any questions, I hope you guys have a great Friday. Don't work too hard this last 30 minutes we're down to for my um, elementary folks. And some of you might even be out. Reach out. Follow me on Twitter. Have a great Friday. Thanks, guys.